Morning. Welcome to Star Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Welcome to all those who may be watching us online this morning. You can find the worship folder right above the window where you are viewing this worship service on our live worship page on our website. It is 5,000 fed Sunday. This is the feeding of 5,000 as we go through that gospel lesson. We'll also look at a different kind of meal during our message this morning. We'll go into the book of Exodus and we'll see how God enjoyed a meal with his people. And it's a foretaste of the one that we're going to enjoy in heaven one day. We worship our God with our opening hymn. It is a gathering rite. The soloist will sing through the refrain once, and the congregation will join in after it. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing
are singing, for the Lord is our light. We are singing, for the Lord is our light. We are singing. Oh, we are singing, for the Lord is our light. We are singing. Please stand. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I am the bread of life, says Jesus Christ. Whoever eats of this bread will never die. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Prepare to be invited to the banquet of the Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we have broken the covenant which You made with us. We have not maintained the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. For the sake of Your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in Your will and walk in Your ways. To the glory of Your holy name. Amen. The bread of life was given for the life of the world. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for His sake our sins are forgiven. Whoever comes to Him will never hunger. Whoever believes in Him will never thirst. Lord, give us that bread always. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, we praise our God. seated. At this time, I invite the children of the congregation to come forward for the children's message. Good morning, boys and girls. I am a little disappointed to say that none of you walked through the goal that I had set up here. One of you walked over one of the cones, but that's okay. You didn't know you were supposed to do it, and I didn't tell you. But what I wanted all of you to do without telling you was to walk through the cones just like that. Now, if I asked you to do it again, all of you could do it flawlessly. We uh, had our soccer camp this past week. Some of you were in attendance and did an incredible job, I might say. But I think you found out pretty quickly that soccer a lot of fun, but to do it perfectly is impossible. How many of you guys watched the World Cup a few weeks ago? Any of the games? Some of you? All right, three, not bad. Okay. Well, do you know that the best players in the world miss all the time? Now, the reason why we're talking about soccer in a children's message is being a Christian is way harder than playing soccer because not only can't you miss, but God says you have to be perfect every single time. How many of you are perfect all the time? Yes! Yes, two. That's good. Good job, Max. Your parents are proud. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's, I'm not perfect all the time. I don't know if any of the adults behind me are perfect all the time. Maybe... Probably not. And the, what do we do if we're not perfect? Well, that's where we get into sacrifice. That's where we get into how we can make up for our wrongs, and the problem is you can't. We're going to talk about that a lot in our story. But you're going to hear about how Jesus 
is the one who makes us perfect because He died for our sins. He lived a perfect life in our place. And because we believe in Him, we're going to heaven one day, even though we can't make a goal every time. Can you fold your hands and pray? Dear Jesus, it is so hard to be perfect. Help us to live more like You every day. Even though we'll never reach perfection, we know that we're forgiven. For this we thank You. Amen. You're excused to go back and sit with your parents. through 44. God is so generous that sometimes He has even preserved His people miraculously as He does here in Kings and in our Gospel lesson. But notice that both times He used the efforts and gifts of people to show their eagerness to help as well as His eagerness to bless. A man came from Baal Shalisha bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley baked bread from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I sit this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. Please stand for the words of our king. Our Gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Jesus creates a need so that He can satisfy it. It did not just suddenly occur to Him that the thousands would be in danger since they had stayed with Him so long. No, He let them stay until there was a problem. And then He solved the problem. He does that wondrous thing in our lives countless times. But often in rescuing, he gives his disciples an opportunity to help him by serving those who are now in such obvious need. The boy shares, the great apostles become traffic cops, and then waiters, and then cleanup men. And when it is all over, Jesus makes sure that what he has done will not get in the way of his march to the cross. What are your opportunities? And then ourselves become the Lord's agents through whom he at least in part answers our prayers. Do you have the fish and the bread? Can you help serve it if another has it to share? Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed Him because they saw the miraculous sign He had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with His disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. 
He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves that left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We bow our heads in prayer. O Lord, your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with our hymn, Hymn 492, Son of God, Eternal Savior. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Before we get to our text, you have to know that as we jump into Exodus, all of the Old Testament focuses on our God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, Jesus says, You diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the Scriptures that testify about me yet you refuse to come to me to have life. This thought is vital any time you go into the Old Testament. Because even though our text in Exodus, as you hear me read it, 
doesn't talk about Jesus anywhere by name. He's everywhere in the text. The sacrifices, the laws that he kept in your place, all of those have to do with Jesus. As you open up any Old Testament scripture, all of it points to Jesus. We believe in a Christocentric Bible. Just as Jesus says. Hear our text from Exodus 34, verses 4 through 7. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls. And the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire. Clears the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate, and they drank. So far, our text. <clears throat> Your Christian friends, it was the 21st World Cup. I know... Many of you could care less because it's soccer. You're probably more interested in the Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio earlier this week, which is the real start of football season in America, right? Well, it doesn't really matter. The point is, this was a big deal to the world. You realize that a billion people watch the final match of the World Cup every year. I think there's only six or seven billion in the world. That's a pretty high percentage. And yet, for the World Cup, with all the qualifying rounds and everything that goes into it, there's a whole lot of losing that goes into the World Cup. And I think that's a pretty good illustration for what we're about to dig into here as we look at God's law a little closer. It is almost impossible to win when you look at God's laws. These Jews had no idea what they were getting into. Yet we're going to look at what they read to here in a second. You're going to see today that God's grace is your only hope. God's commandments show that you need it. The Old Testament sacrifices symbolize that grace. And the New Testament sacraments seal that grace. Dear friends, listen to these first verses one more time. Then Moses went and told the people all the words and laws. Ah, there's a lot here. We include the moral law, the Big Ten, Ten Commandments. This is the civil law, who they could marry. This is the ceremonial law. This includes eating kosher, um, the whole system of sacrifices and their worship life, the whole clean and unclean. Yeah, all of that is involved with these laws. Now, how hard is it to keep them all? Well, you can check out their answer. They responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. Now, just in case they would forget, he wrote it down so they could go back and review. And yet, what exactly does it mean to keep all those laws? I'm sure that they tried to keep the laws, but how impossible is it to keep these laws? That's ah, really hard. I mean, I'm talking every rule, every lustful thought, every thought in anger. And I'm just talking thoughts now because actions are too easy. I cannot control my thoughts that well. And my, I, I can't control my actions that well either. But consider greed. Do you realize that um, the IRS gave back 6 billion people to the wrong people? They do this all the time. The whole tax code is just a disaster. 
In fact, there was one household, this is a few years ago, mind you, but this is, uh, I think it's four years ago, this is in Lansing, Michigan. This address filed 2,100 illegal tax submissions. And the IRS refunded $3.3 million to that one address. Now, before you rip on the IRS, they caught the guy, okay? But that's a gross, like, how do you screw that up, IRS, yeah. But anyway, that just touches on part of the problem. Well, that's wrong, okay? You should not do that. And yet you should not withhold even one penny that the IRS has coming to it because our God says that we pay taxes. That's part of our civic duty as Christians. And yet I got to tell you, once in a while I think, man, I don't know if I really want to give that money to the government for a number of reasons. But that's not the point. God doesn't say, what do you think, Fred? He says, pay up. <laughs> he doesn't care. It is really hard to keep God's law. And at any time you break even one of those commandments, this is where we get to raise our hands if we're perfect, we're worthy of hell. And even if that sounds bad, understand that you have offended the holy God. And your God is not some tottering old fool in heaven who doesn't know what's going on. He cannot be the omniscient, all-powerful, holy God and allow sin to stand. It doesn't work that way. Something has to give. And so this is where we get into the, well, stressful part of the text. Yet this is very real. Ezekiel says, the soul who sins is the one who will die. God's grace is your only hope. His commands show that you need it. And you're going to see here that the Old Testament sacrifices symbolize it. This is what happened. He got up, this is Moses, got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The people agreed to everything that God had laid out. So the next day, this is the official ceremony of accepting this covenant, this agreement between you and God. I suppose homeowners associations have bad covenants that involve pink flamingos and pools and campers in the front yard. No, this is a real covenant with real laws that involve your God. You keeping them, well, the Old Testament people, and God keeping his end of the bargain too. They agreed to obey it, so we set up this 12 stone pillars then he sent young Israelite men. There's no priesthood yet. We just grabbed 12 guys. Okay, you're up. And they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. This is two of like six different kinds of sacrifices that are laid out in the Old Testament. The burnt offering, the olah, you put the animal on the altar and the whole thing is burnt. All of it. Just consumed. It's an offering to God. Fellowship offering was a little different. This is where you burn some of it. Some of it you keep and you eat and you have a meal. We're going to get to that at the end of our sermon here. Moses took half the blood and put it in bowls. And the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Now that's yucky. But they drained the blood. And so you have to understand what's going on. The altar behind them sprinkled with blood. Okay, now we turn around. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. And then Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Dip in the blood, sprinkle, sprinkle. You can feel it's wet and watery. At camp last week, they did this and the guy had a bucket of water and made everybody close their eyes. And I don't think it was this text, but it was something similar with sprinkling the blood. And after embellishing what it was going to be and how it was going to feel, when that water hit the kids' faces, they're like, ew, this is blood. This is a blood theology. And the reason why Christianity is a blood theology is because the soul who sins is the one who will die. The Old Testament believers understood that if I sin, something dies. That's the first point. Second point, it's not me. Yes. Third point, all of these point to Jesus. Do you think God cares about these animals? This is all worship. This is all picture 
of one day the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Christos, they both mean anointed, will come and die for my sins. He's the ultimate sacrifice. So what these turn into for these Old Testament Christians is this is like a thank you. This is how they worship God. This is their spiritual act of worship. Now, as gross as that sounds, let me read from you a chunk of, from Hebrews. This is Hebrews 9, just a couple verses. Hebrews 9, here we go. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, He sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law required that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That, that's a very harsh thought. And then you go back to tax codes and IRS, sinful thoughts. We asked the kids at camp, how many animals would have to die for your mourning here at camp? How many times did you sin? And the one, <laughs> I asked the one boy, how many times are you going to sin today? And he goes, about 40. He had an average. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's honest. I didn't really argue with him, but that's one way to look at it. And it's awful. And yet that's the picture that we have. Well, God's grace is your only hope. His commandments show you that you need it. The Old Testament sacrifices symbolize it. Now, what about the New Testament? These seal it. I am thankful that the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. I'm thankful that Good Friday happened. <clears throat> Easter is the guarantee that everything that Jesus did worked. Death has lost its sting. Sin has no grip on you. All of that is over. So what do we do in the New Testament church to celebrate that? To remember it? Well, we enjoy this fellowship meal. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. We don't know exactly what this was. Lapis lazuzi is a real word. It's just another word for any blue rock. This specific mineral is mined in Iran. It's kind of a big deal because it's all over the place in Iran. And it's kind of cool looking. And if you read a couple different translations, that's what this Hebrew word translates into. And I can't imagine having a stone floor in the church that looks like that. I also can't imagine having all of you gathered together at this banquet from the fellowship offerings that were just offered and having God in all of his glory waltz up to the table, sit down, and say, let's eat. I don't know what that's going to be like. It's not normal. God tells, I think one of the prophets, no one can see my face and live. Oh, it was Moses. And in this last verse of our text, but God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate, and they drank. Something's different here. And it's as if for this first fellowship meal, where the nation of Israel leaves Egypt and comes to Sinai, and we're going to start off on the right foot, God suspends all normal rules and you guys are okay because we made this covenant. How long can they keep it? <laughs> Not long at all. But <clears throat> it's a neat picture. It is completely out of the ordinary. And I wonder what it's going to be like in heaven. But I don't have to wonder that hard because we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Not this week, next week we'll celebrate it, but You'll have the opportunity to taste and see how good your God is when Jesus comes to you and knows that you're forgiven. The words in the sacrament given and shed for you are where the Gospel lies in that. And it's there that you can remember that you are loved even though you're sinful. That no matter what guilt you carry to the table at the Lord's Supper, you know that Jesus has washed it away. The other sacrament that we have, remember, it's easy for God to forgive. It's hard for us to believe it. Is that baptismal font. The reason it's in the back is not to hide it. It's so that when you walk in, you don't see it there and you hit your knee on it. That's what we want you to do. 
so you're reminded of it. We give baptismal banners so that people hang it on their, al- their altar, hang it on their door of their bedroom or their wall so when you wake up in the morning, you know that I am washed and nothing can change that truth. I am God's. I am forgiven. Now, how many of you would have purchased a ticket, if you could have, to get into that Russian stadium? I'm not even going to try to pronounce the word. They renovated about a year before the World Cup to make sure everything was A-OK. The week of the World Cup, tickets for the lower deck, the good seats, were going for, well, OK, the face value was a little over 1000 For obese seats, handicap and obstructed view was a little over 500 A little under. I think it was 455 now, the week of World Cup, like the black market tickets, these are going for more than six figure. $100,000 to go. They interviewed one gentleman, they said, why would you pay this much to go? And they said, well, I didn't live anywhere, but this is once in a lifetime. Oh, okay, that makes sense, sure. Drop six figures on a World Cup ticket. I, I, there's no way I could even imagine spending $1,000 on it. TV coverage is pretty good. But just to be there, some of these people spent that money. There's only 80,000 in there. Do you know how many seats there'll be in heaven? One for each of you. Your God says, in my Father's house are many rooms. Go on, that's what I told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and it's a whole lot nicer than those seats. And you get to see something way cooler than the World Cup. You get to see me in all my glory. You get to be in fellowship with me. There's all kinds of pictures of heaven. And yet, at that time, it all kind of... I don't know how to explain it. And yet, I know that I'm going there. I know that you will too. Because God's grace is our only hope. I know that I can't keep God's commandments, but it doesn't matter. All those Old Testament sacrifices pointed ahead to Jesus. The Lamb of God who take away the sins of the world. And when we celebrate the sacraments, it seals that faith that God has brought to our hearts by the power of the Spirit. That's how we know that our God loves us. That's how we know that we're forgiven. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We praise our God with the song printed in your worship folder.
Please stand for prayer. Almighty and unchanging God, by our baptisms into death and the resurrection of Your Son, Jesus Christ, You have redeemed us from spiritual blindness, selfishness, and all dead works. Raise us up in the grace of our baptisms day by day that we may see You more clearly, love You more dearly, and follow You more nearly. Through Christ Jesus our Savior, who makes all things new, we join in the prayer that You've taught us. Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are Yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close our worship with our final hymn, hymn 326, May the Grace of Christ our Savior. seated. There are a whole lot of announcements. Just to keep on your radar screen, the neighborhood cook coming up on August 24th. That sign-up sheet is live. Tell your friends, Romans countrymen, to come. New students, the back-to-school cookout. It is a good time. Absolute worst case, you get a delicious burger. I don't want to say that I perfected the craft of making a burger, but they're pretty good. Just being humble and all that. Um, men's luncheon this month is a week late, and it's going to be at the Arcadia Family Restaurant and Pizzeria. And of course, thank you to all who helped with the Little Stars soccer camp. It was a raging success. Most we've ever had. Um, it, it went really, really well. Kind of wet, obviously. We lost two days, but um, getting three in was still a success, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, even, on, even on the days that it rained, you can see God's rainbow and his promise to never flood the world again. So, our Bible study.